I threatened you then by saying that what I'd like to do is show this video again, but then get you guys to all uh, contribute uh, and come up with some ideas. And this is going to fit in very uh, much with the talks that we've just seen, especially what Anne's been saying, what Penilla's been saying. So the um, background to this project, uh, it was called uh, Learning from Loss, and it was a joint project, University of St. Andrews, which is where I'm from. Mistakenly, yesterday I said I was from Stirling, I'm not quite sure why. Uh, and also the University of Stirling, uh, and it was uh, sponsored by the Scottish University's Insight Institute um, with help from Historic Environment Scotland. And I'm going to show this video, but it, it's, the whole project was coming out of the work that uh, Joanna and Ellie and myself have been doing with the Scotland's Coastal Heritage at Risk Project. So we're not actually going to be talking about Sharp at all, because I'm sure um, many of you will have heard us talking about that in the past. Uh, on the trip, we brought together um, members of the two universities, plus some colleagues from the United States uh, and members of Historic Environment Scotland, together with local authority archaeologists and other archaeologists. And we did a road trip which sort of started in Edinburgh, and then we went all the way up, the, um, up to Aberdeen, took a ferry to Orkney. So if you think of Scotland, and then you think where Iceland is, there's a set of islands in between, and Orkney is the first set of islands, and you have Shetland, then you have the Faroes. Uh, so we went up to Orkney, uh, looking at eroding sites and talking to community members and uh, various other stakeholders. So this is an eroding site in Fife, um, which is where we started. We also had a number of workshops and sit-down sessions, both in Historic Environment Scotland and in community centres around the uh, country. We visited a whole bunch of archaeological sites of different site, uh, types, and I'm showing you these because these will be mentioned in the film. This is the Broch at Loch Ness on Sandy. So much of the film is going to be talking about the island of Sandy uh, in Orkney, but this is the Broch and Sandy. This is the whalebone plaque that was found as part of the Scar boat burial up on Sandy, so that was rescued uh, during a, a, an excavation of an eroding site. And this is an aerial view of the Muir Burnt Mound uh, so this is a Bronze Age burnt mound with a well, and uh, there's actually a Neolithic well underneath that. Uh, this is the Muir burnt mound under excavation, so the film will then start talking about the different options, and Penilla was talking about these options, so one of the things that you can do is you can excavate sites. Uh, this is another site that we visited in Brora in the east coast. Uh, relocation, again, we came across that, and so the site, uh, this is a relocation of a, a project that we did up in Shetland, but that site at Muir, we did um, move it, and here is the, the um, site after we'd moved it to the Heritage Centre. Uh, they'll be talking about sandbagging. This is actually the community over in Orkney sandbagging one of their sites because there are eroding uh, human remains coming out of that site. So this isn't actually being done by the state. This is being done by uh, communities. And then the film will also talk about other options, uh, and I'll throw another couple in. One of them is you can make films about things, so you can just like, allow things to disappear and just go and have fun instead. Uh, this is the Weems Caves 4D uh, website. That uh, model that you see there is actually based on a structure from motion of the entire coast. So this was drone flight, uh, but we also at that site did a lot of laser scanning. So this is all to go into the, the digital stuff that we've been talking about earlier. The film will also touch on what should we be doing about the sites where we don't actually know what is there. We know that there's a great site, but we can't really say what it is. So here's uh, Joe standing below a, a, a large midden, which you can see sort of going down all the way up to her shoulders. But you can also see that there's a structure in uh, by her, from her shoulders down to the floor. We have no idea whether that's uh, Norse, whether it's a Neolithic Iron Age, Bronze Age, who knows. Uh, the film will also touch on tourism. And if you look at the destination of that bus, that is actually a public bus going to Scarabray. But of course, the main problem is that all the cruise boats coming in, bringing in thousands of tourists to some of these quite remote places. Uh, and again, I said, and then the, the, the role of the communities. Communities will come out very strongly. So here is the community out in Sandy discussing various options. And at the end of the film, I would like you to dis, like, just think about some of these points. So here are some questions. I'll bring these back up again uh, at the end of the film. Um, but it would be great if we can get a few ideas. And if, if you all decide that you don't want to talk about this, that's fine, because we do have a Satish's film to watch as well, which will be a bit of light relief after this. I do have to apologise um, about the quality of the film. It, I've, it's not finished yet. And also, when I was making it, uh, the, the people who were being interviewed uh, had been on a road trip for 10 days. They hadn't had very much sleep, and I did put a camera right up into their face. Uh, and there are going to be lots of cutaways to like hide uh, se several things uh, when I finish the film. But this is just definitely to give you an idea uh, of what happened during the learning from lost trip. So with no further ado, 
Uh, what have we been looking at the last few days? I feel like we've had this epic road trip, ferry trip around Scotland to see sites at risk. Several folks have asked me on this trip, so what does Scotland have to do with the U.S. and the National Park Service? The fact is, uh, you're losing your coastlines rapidly and so are we, so it's a similar, uh, similar problem. Uh, and a lot of it has really resonated with sites we have in Florida that are eroding out of similar sand dune structures. And it's very relevant to our sites in Florida, and actually the whole coast, the coastal sites all the way around the states. Well, it's interesting how international and global the heritage at risk topic is. And I'm, well, I'm continually trying to compare the situation that I've seen here in Scotland on our trip with the situations that I am facing, the, the issues and problems that I'm trying to provide solutions for back in the U.S. Um, so we've been on Sandy for the past couple of days, looking at various coastal heritage sites that, have, that are at risk of erosion. The island shape is like a dragon, and, and, um, and on each, how do you say, the, <laughs> on each end of the dragon, <laughs> there are some exposed archaeological features. It's a major part of this island's heritage, the archaeology. Well, there's a lot going on. I think I was struck with not only the number of sites that we've seen, but all of the complexity and the potential information that lies behind them. The extent of your uh, occupations, the length of time, um, is just amazing. And certainly there are sites here which are unique in the British Isles. This is the first time I visited Sandy and it didn't take long to realise that many of the coastal heritage sites are really susceptible to things like coastal erosion. Yes, yeah, it's a big problem here because Sandy is really low lying. So every winter we get huge tides and huge uh, winds. Uh, and especially on this island, the winter storms can be so horrific. Coastal erosion is an issue that's exacerbated by climate change, um, sea level rise, uh, changes in patterns of storms and intensity of storms, things like that. Hearing from the community members and people working on the islands about the way the coastline has been retreating in certain places over the last few years and how they are in their own lifetime seeing more climatic events, more serious events, more serious storms. Yeah, I've got an old, an old broch, 100 yards from the, the main farmhouse maybe. It's a substantial been a substantial building at one time, but it's disappearing. And I lived near the Scar boat burial one, so I keep an eye on that. And there's more of that being exposed. Yeah, well, there's a big storm. And I get down to the beach to see what like the wall was, in case it was undermined, and I found all the stones sticking up out of the beach. So I went in and got Ruth and wife to come and have a look. This particular one here at Mer is a case in point. It will, this winter will be completely covered in boulders and pebbles again and uh, one of these days there will be a major storm, force 10, 12 and it will wash the whole thing away. I've experienced a whole range of emotions from um, oh my gosh we can't save that um, to how can we save that. So I think this experience of, of meeting with communities, visiting sites has really raised my appreciation for, for the seriousness of the issue. If we do take um, a, a do-nothing approach, then we're potentially facing sort of fairly, fairly extreme loss. I think it's really important that these sites that are susceptible to coastal erosion and sea level rise are re recorded appropriately. Then start analysing what is possible here and looking at do we do site excavations, as you know, um, coastal defences? Are we doing the 3D laser scanning? Are we, are we documenting or picking things up and moving them? In, in an ideal world, we'd like them to be excavated, wouldn't we? Everybody would, wherever they live, not just on Sunday. Yes, well, the one at Moor that we've been working on, that's like, we had to relocate it because it was getting washed away. Well, if it's something worth rescuing, they should rescue them, but if no, I mean, you, maybe try and protect them, I don't know. That's maybe on some of these sites as much as we can do, is to, to buy some time um, through, through coastal defences. I think using of sandbags and, and community monitoring is a really good way of, of, of buying a bit of time and thinking about what the approaches might need to be to, as that heritage, um, as the artefacts and the archaeology within those sites are exposed.
Um, I think there must be a range of um, options for uh, the sites. I think to build walls around many of the sites would be far too expensive and not possible. And, and again, coastal defences have a lot of their own problems and, and have to be thought about on a site-by-site on a -site basis. Rescue them or record them or excavate them for future generations and yeah, educate the kids. And if it's all going to be lost, it would be a shame that you couldn't you couldn't find it and store it away somewhere that it's safe for future generations to see. Well, it should be to something, but I mean, the amount of this, it would be, it wouldn't be able to protect them all, so you'd need to, to pick on the most important ones and try and rescue them. It, it needs to be prioritised to, to see what the most important ones are and possibly have a good go at them, but you can't look at everyone. There's, there's not enough manpower or man hours to do them all. One of the big questions that we face uh, you know, in Florida and, and also here in Scotland is how do we prioritize sites? How do we, in the face of certain loss of uh, a substantial amount of coastal areas, how do we, how do we decide which sites to save, uh, which sites to protect, which sites to excavate, and which sites to just uh, walk away from? And one of the other things that I think is also extremely important that I've been trying to fit into our larger model is saving a diversity of sites. I don't know what would be best. Money would be the biggest problem. You wouldn't could, could not do them all. One of the great challenges that I know we're facing in the Park Service is really realizing that we are not going to be able to save everything. Uh, that said, uh, we have to figure out some, some tough ways to make choices, uh, to either focus on, on a few sites and get a lot of information, or maybe to focus on a lot of sites, get a little information. The big thing that we've talked about, though, is significance and that sense of why are these different places important. If the I suppose, do the ones that you're going to get the most benefit from. The values of size have three major components. One is the intrinsic values, and second is the social value. Well, by social, it also includes community, spiritual, you name it, these kind of values. And the third one is economic values. I think that you look at, you know, rarity, um, you know, how many sites like that do you have recorded, um, and then, of course, how strong is the community? How can, can they really help? I think we should prioritise sites by the ones we could actually see being eroded year by year, even month by month. We really see it as an iterative process of trying to work through which sites are most at risk, why are they most at risk, what is the greatest value, and then working with those pieces to figure out the best next set of steps going forward. I think in terms of gaining the knowledge and exploring, getting a sense of the scope of the sites and perhaps what may be there, the potential that they have, is really important in terms of determining what sort of action people might want to take. So what do we do with the sites that, for which we don't yet have the information? We don't know how important they are. We don't know what stories they contain. Yeah, it's been haunting me a bit, this question of significance, because um, even when we know the significance, there's usually pockets we don't know. When we don't know, if it's significant, then you're working with a truly blank slate. I really think we need to find a way to recover the who, what, uh, where, when, why, and how for these sites. We need to actually incorporate a maybe a bonus sign or a plus sign or some other check mark to say this is a site that we don't yet know anything about, and we should put some emphasis toward sites that we have not yet explored. And some of the sites can actually be used to create some, um, how to say, economic benefit. And in order to generate some income to, um, how to say, to benefit the whole, whole community, the whole society, the whole island. There are businesses here who, who run on, on being holiday making businesses. So yes, having um, an economic attraction that is to do with archaeology coming here for holiday could also be good. And it brings people to the island and helps our economy because the archaeologists come and stay and eat and shop and <laughs> not probably wanting it to be enormous sites which attract um, cruise ships and, and would destroy the environment. But on the other hand, uh, involving people with, with what's here could, could be good. Sandy has to find something that, that's unique to them. For example, uh, one thing that can be promoted or repackaged is the, uh, the comprehensiveness and also the, the, the large scale of the archaeological remains that has been found 
on this island. But I think it's also important to think about the, the aspects of knowledge creation um, and knowledge sharing and also the social dynamics, social value and the ways in which community um, resilience and community understanding can be built. I think there's a couple things that stand out. One is, um, one thing that I, I think is important is the local value, the significance of resources to local communities has got to be, has got to be of importance. I think the local significance, I mean, that, that's kind of what first initially shores up a site. So if it's not on their radar, if it's not significant to them, you've got a whole other uh, uphill battle of motivation to try and rally around some of these sites at risk. I really think that the community um, and their ability to mobilize and do the recording and, and interpret it is, is really key. I think it would be a big mistake to leave out the community. I think you'd find yourself in 100 years with sites that don't matter to people. But if you're going to engage people and engage certainly the youngsters on the island, you've got to have a lot of discussion and um, good opportunities for people to be involved. That the information is shared, artifacts are, are held within the community museums. It was very interesting that, that um, some of the opinions from local people was that um, it's almost an expert's position to be prioritising these sites. Yes, you need the expert, so then we can do it there. We'll just go in, we're picking a spade and take it up. And... We need expertise and we need people from outside to help us. And I think collaboration is, is key here. In an ideal world, then we would like to see that we get regular visits from archaeologists. I think the, the emphasis should come from the local community and then they should get all the necessary people round the table um, to talk about what the best approach would be. Oh, well, that's up to the experts. I don't know enough about archaeology to gain what to do with that. What I've seen over the last 10 days is really, that's how we can start some of those conversations. Mm -hmm. This is how we start to frame some of those discussions and get towards some of those decisions. So I've been so grateful for the chance to have those discussions, watch them happen, meet a lot of the people, and I'll be taking those stories back with me to the US. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. Um, oh no, that's not me. Can you do the right thing? Maybe. Great. Well, thanks very much. Yeah. So here are the questions. So this, you've just seen the views of a lot of people and uh, deliberately I didn't actually say who was who. You might have recognised some of the people and you might have been able to work out from the accents who were local and who weren't local, but maybe not in every case, I'm not sure.